Well, it's my uh, privilege and honor once again to be able to share with you guys this morning. And when Trevor uh, initially asked me, he said, hey, would you be open to do this? Um, you know, and it's tying in with the, the interns uh, being dedicated out this morning. He said, you know, try to make it something youthful. I'm like, oh, man, something youthful. And I thought about it for a little bit. And, and what God laid on my heart was... Um, Something that I, I think definitely applies to our youth, but obviously applies to everybody. And it's a, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult concept. And it's been a stress for me, to be honest with you, trying to prepare in, in such a way that I can, I can give you truth that doesn't come across as, hey, man, you're just a terrible person. <laughs> hey, man, we got so much to work on. I don't want it to come across from a place of, of arrogance, because this is a sermon that I'm preaching to myself and to my family. I don't want it to come across from a place of hopelessness, because at the end of it, it's all about our hope in Jesus. It's all about the hope of an eternal life. And that's what I want to convey to you this morning. So please bear with me. If at times it feels a little bit like a lecture, I apologize. Uh, I truly do. But I hopefully, by the time that we get done this morning, we'll have a greater perspective of who God is and a greater perspective of who we are in God. Okay, now that we're, you're as nervous as I am, we will uh, just pray quickly. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for this house, that we get to come and worship you freely, God. There are so many places in this world that, that believers cannot gather in your name. And we never want to take that for granted, Father. And as we listen to your words today, Father, I just pray that they would be your words and not mine, that they would be your inspiration and your desire, Father, and that each one of us would be able to take those words and apply it to our lives so that we could draw closer to you. God, we just love you, and we thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. <clears throat> So the title of, of my sermon this morning is, is, is The True God. And to put it into context, um, you know, a lot of stuff that you're going to hear today probably will be stuff that you're familiar with. But the context that I want to come at it is a little bit different. And when we're looking at the youth, you know, we are, we are designed as human beings to, to always progress. We're designed to always do better. You know, the next generation is always better than the previous generation. Not saying that from an age or a humanistic perspective, but I'm saying that from a phone, okay? How many of us feel the rub when you've got the old phone, right? And you're struggling away and the guy shows up that's got that new thing and it just kind of reads his mind and bloop. And you're like, ah, oh, man, the progression, right? How many of you guys were around, I'm gonna date myself, when, when those first computers came out, right? And they had these massive disks that you used to have to slide in there, the floppies, the five and a quarter inch floppies, and you'd slide it in there, and the thing took forever, but you're so excited because this machine was actually doing something, okay? And the screen was green. You remember the green screen with the doot, doot, doot? And you'd have to punch in, and there was very little you could do, but it was exciting. And if we were to give that to our, our youth today, they'd be like, oh, come on, man. Why? Because as we progress... As we get better, the things we look behind get worse. Okay, we do that all the time. There is an innate desire in us to improve ourselves and improve our situations. You just look at, at water, you know, when, when back, back, back in the day, they used to only be able to grow around, around rivers, right? And then they designed the aqueduct systems and they were able to take the water and they were able to... Why? Because they were improving, and pretty soon they were, they were digging wells. And then the waters come into our, our houses. And, and if we were to go backwards, it's always a negative persona. We're designed as human beings to improve our situation and improve ourselves. And I'd say that psychologically, I know Athena's in the house and, and she can correct me. She's welcome to come up and correct me if she wants to. But I would say that that, that continual okay, pressing that we have on our mind actually actually affects our psyche to the point that if, if we're not progressing in life, what do we get? We get depressed, right? Because I'm not improving myself. I'm not improving. And you're thinking, man, where's this guy going with this? 
We've been designed to modernize ourselves. We've been designed to progress ourselves. And we do the same thing to God. Our society has, has progressed in a lot of issues, and a lot of big issues. And we've needed to, because those issues weren't founded on biblical truth. We've progressed on, on how we perceive race, how we, how we interact with the different sexes. We've progressed on our understanding of these things because they didn't start in a good place. And that's a good thing. But a lot of times, as we progress, it's to our own benefit. And something that our culture, that our society, and this isn't just South African culture, this isn't just American culture, this is every culture, and you hear it all the time. You have a voice. You are important. Whatever you want to do, apply yourself to it. And you can do it. Now that's an amazing truth that we need to be able to teach to our kids. That's an amazing truth that we need to be able to accept in and of ourselves. But the problem is that we start applying that to God. We start looking at God and we start putting our progression, our desire onto God. And you see this all the time. People have discussions, well, I don't think God would, would, well, I don't think God would like that. No, I think God would be fine with that. No, I think, I think, I think. And what we've done is because my opinion is so, is so strong and my opinion is worthwhile, what happens is I equate my opinion to who God is. And we can see this all the time. And so we've become a generation, we've become a world that no longer sees the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We see the God of Facebook, Instagram, and culture. Now, it's not about making those our gods. That's not what it's about. Some people, yes, those are, those are gods, and they sit on those things, and, and that, that is who they are. But that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is the perception that those platforms have given us of who God is. And you're thinking, oh, man, social media doesn't, that doesn't create my perception of God. I know who God is. Okay? Okay. Well, I've got a couple memes. All right. And this, this is, uh, I have to give photo credit to, to Mr. Cabello. Um, for any of you that do know Cabello or on his social media anywhere, you'll find that a, a meme pops up about every five minutes. And, and some of them are amazing. Some of them I'm just like, oh, come on, Cubs. Come on. But we've got some this morning. And, and I just want you to look at them. And I, and I hope you can gain an understanding uh, of what I'm trying to get to. Okay, so the first one that, that we have up on, on the screen, it's... Slightly coming. It's on my screen. Is it up there? Nope. All right. Well, we'll just read it out then. We'll wait till it, till it comes up. Okay? So the first one is, is um, the wording on it says, Life is so much simpler when you stop explaining yourself to people and just do what works for you. Whew. Man, right? And you read that thing and you're like, oh, okay, fantastic. Fantastic. I'm just going to go do this thing. Because why? It's about me, right? Social, social media, everything, it's about me. It's about my progression. It's about doing this thing. So you know what? This is, this is a good lesson. And we take it and we're like, oh, man, I've got a good, good thought for the day and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plow into this difficult life. Okay? The next one. And, and this one, unfortunately, you can't see the picture of it. But it's a, it's, it's a picture of this little girl and, and she's kind of out. I think it's on a beach, but you, you see her putting her hands up. And it says, don't underestimate the healing power of these three things. Music the ocean, and stars. And some of you laugh, and some of you are like, yeah, man. Yeah, music. How many, of, how many guys like to stick the music in, eh? And when, when we're doing it, oh, yes. That music just rejuvenates. And you're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. And the stars, honestly, how many of you guys have sat out and just looked at the stars and the awesomeness of what it is? So you sit there and go, okay. And I perceive what works for me out of that little meme. And I take and I say, okay, this is, this is what I want to do. All right, the next one we have, it's just words on, on the screen. It says, a positive mind, positive li vibes, positive life. Fantastic. Now, most of us would agree positivity is a good thing. Right? But, but the problem is that when we have a, a, a slide like this, when we have a meme like this, 
it's not telling us what positivity is. It's allowing us to interpret for ourselves and then move on with life. So we say, hey man, positive, positive vibes means this for me, and so I go do this thing. I don't know what it means to you, but that's fine because you're on your journey, I'm on my progression. Okay, and then the last one I have from the world, it says, the hardest walk is walking alone, but it also makes you the strongest. Wow. Wow. And how many of us take, take uh, oh, we take solace in that, right? Because we feel like, man, I'm walking alone in this thing. I'm all by myself. And so we, we read that and we, we read that on our social media, our Instagram. We say, yes, oh man, I'm in the hardest walk, but it's, but it's going to make me the strongest. What does that mean? What if you're walking in the wrong direction? What if you're not even walking? But we allow it to feed into our lives, and we create the perception of what we want it to be. So you think, okay, these are all worldly things. How does this change our perception of God? Okay, well, we have a couple from the Christian perspective. Okay, and, and a lot of times, it's, just, it's the same exact thing. As we throw out these memes, as we read these things, okay, then we're, we apply it to our lives, but not with truth. We apply it to our lives with the perception of progress. All right, do we have that one, Crystal? Nope. Nope, struggling. Okay, let me see. The, the first one that should be coming up, keep on praying. Keep on praying. Okay, now that's a, that sounds simple, and that's great. That's a good biblical truth. But if we don't understand what we're praying about, if we're praying about the wrong direction, if we're not praying in the way that we need to be praying, then all we're doing is taking a biblical truth and we're putting our perception onto what we believe that is saying. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Okay, the second one that I had was, it says, Dear God, help me to make the decisions according to your will and not my emotions. Wow, that's powerful. And that's true. Help me to make decisions based on your will and not my emotions. But how many of us would sit and say, man, we don't actually understand God's will? Even though it's pretty simple, we sit and say, man, I don't understand God's will, but I'll read that. And I'm going to apply that to my life because you know what? I think this is what God's saying. And because our mindset is progression, we change who God is to be who we want him to be. And we move forward. And we become, we become who we want to be. Okay, the next one was um, a quote from, from Billy Graham that says, Salvation is free, but discipleship costs everything we have. Great. And we sit and we read that, and, and most people go, man, I don't even know what discipleship means. I don't know what that is. But we take it and we, we say, okay, I'm going to think about it this way, and I'm going to apply it to my life. The last one I had, it says, when you pray, God listens. When you listen, God talks. And when you believe, God works. Now that sounds awesome. The problem is that there is nothing about truth and about who God is in that statement. And you know how terribly, terribly dangerous that is? Because if I change my perception of God, when I pray to Him, I think, man, He's listening to me, and God is listening, okay? And when I, when I stop to listen, He talks to me. Now, if I don't have the correct perception of who God is, I've created God to be who I want to be because, man, this is a progression. God can't look down on that. God has to accept that then when I believe, I'm not believing in God, I'm believing in what I want to believe in, me. And so as a younger generation, I see a lot of people, I see a lot of people that are faced with a society that says, is God really like that? Is God really like that? And our psyche sit there and go, oh, okay, no, we can accept that. You know, that was Old Testament stuff. Man, that was New Testament stuff. Man, that was New Testament, but that was a long time ago. Culture's changed. Things have changed. No, God, God doesn't frown on that anymore. The best one, man, no, you've got grace. You've got grace. Don't, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. We create, we create who God is to us as we make Him, as we progress Him into a modern situation. <clears throat> so left to ourselves... And where does this come from? Usually it's from a lack of information. Usually it's from a, a lack of, of diving in and actually understanding who God is. But left to ourselves, Chip Ingram, 
It says that left to ourselves, we shrink God to be a manageable God. We shrink Him. Why? Because if we can't understand it and, and, and God is set up at such a high pedestal, then, then we can't grasp that. We bring Him back down to what makes sense to us. And in that shrinking process, He brings out three things. Three problems we have is that we assume God is like us. How many of us, when you ask, man, who's your, what's your opinion of God? Man, He's this big guy and He does these things. And, and the problem is when we assume God is like us, then we put our emotions and our progression onto God. Man, I don't see this as wrong anymore because now I've progressed in my life, and so I do the same thing to God. Man, no, God's going to accept this. No, God's, not gonna, God, God's going to accept that too. And we start working with this individual God that we have created ourselves. The second thing, the second problem we have is we reduce him to a measurable and controllable quantity. Okay, and we do that all the time. We want to be able to measure God. We want to be able to put him into a box and, and figure out how do we work with this box. And if we're being honest, the reason we stick God into a box and we want to be honest to that box is because if we can control that box, then maybe, maybe I can still do what I want to do and, and have God say, hey, well done, well done. We change God when left to ourselves into a manageable and controllable entity. And the last thing that, last problem that he says is we overlook how God has revealed himself to us. We belittle the awesomeness of God. We sit and we sang a song, like the Revelation song that was the last one uh, on the list today. Holy, holy, holy is God Almighty, King of kings. We praise, we worship this amazing being absolutely amazing being. <clears throat> but we forget to see how real that is in our lives. We forget to see, we overlook the holiness. We overlook the perfection of what God is. Why? Because if we look at that, then it conflicts with the progression that we've developed in our minds. Okay, so you say, hey, not easy, not, not me. Okay? Most people, okay, the older generation are sitting there going, ah, okay, yeah, they got it. But, but we still read our Bibles. We still do these things. Okay, well, well Chip Ingram's got, in his, in his book, he's got this little test. And so I'm going to ask you to take a test for me this morning. And, and I truly, truly, truly want you to think about this. Okay? I want you to think about this. It's, it's on a sliding scale. And, and why am I having you take this test? Because our perception of God and how modern our God is, okay, will determine how much we actually do for him. All right? So the first question on your test, is everybody ready? I know this is a pop quiz, but you don't have to have known anything beforehand. So the first question is, okay, on a sliding scale of, say, one to five, how much energy do you have for God? Because, you know, people that understand God, he says, have great energy for God. And he said, back, oh man, this is, okay, what does that mean? Great energy for God. That's not just me showing up at church. That's not me just studying the word. That's me having energy to see when there's issues out there that I can get into and put God into those issues. So on a sliding scale of one to five, how much energy do you have for God? The second question that he poses is the greatness of, of your thoughts about God. How great are your thoughts about God? Now, if we were honest, a lot of us would say, man, you know, on Sunday morning, I think God is amazing. He is a king of kings. This isn't talking about a Sunday morning. This is talking about when you go through your week. How great are your thoughts about God? Because people that understand God have great, amazing thoughts about his holiness, about who he is, about his majesty. On a sliding scale of one to five, how great are your thoughts about God? The third question that he poses is the degree of boldness for God. Woo. The degree of boldness, sliding scale of one to five. 
How bold are you for this God that we proclaim as our Lord and Savior? How bold am I? Now, I know it's getting uncomfortable, but these questions are there to highlight the fact that maybe we don't understand, maybe we haven't grasped who God is. And the last question that he, that he poses is the level of contentment in God. People that understand who God is have a great contentment in God. Now, a contentment in God, that is not a progression with God. That is a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is the God of the Old Testament, the God that is existing today, and our contentment level in Him and Him alone, irregardless of what else is going in our lives. On a scale of one to five, how content are you in God? Now, that's a tough test. And to be honest, most of us fail those tests. Why? Because we get caught up in the progression of our life. We get caught up in what's new and how I've got to get to this point. So I want you to remember that, okay? I want you to remember those, five, those four questions. And I want you to try and come back to those things because if that's important, and we'll see why that's important in a minute, then it gives you a level, it gives you a measure to see, am I actually improving? Am I actually drawing closer to God? Or am I just drawing God closer to me? So we move on from there. The question is, how, how modern is your God? We need to know the real God, the unchangeable God, the immovable God, the eternal God that was and is and will be. Understanding God allows us to understand ourselves, and understanding ourselves leads to action. I promise you that you, we will never be forced into action if we don't understand who God is if we don't actually grasp that. And so when we are looking at the Bible, when we're looking at God, there's a lot of His attributes that are constant, that are fixed, that, that cannot be changed. You look at his, at, at his justice. You look at His faithfulness. You look at His sovereignty. You look at His goodness. Trevor preached about His goodness the other day. But the one that I want to look at today, just to highlight briefly, is God's holiness. Now, I know when we're, when we're talking about holiness, a lot of us understand, okay, God is holy. But what does holy mean? Holy means set apart. Holy means separate. Holy means unique, okay? Us calling God holy means that He is like nothing else in existence. He is fully unique. <clears throat> he is set apart from everything else. And so we look at the Bible and we say, okay, how are we going to discover God's holiness? Well, a couple of the, of the stories, we, we all know the, the characters of Moses. And we know the character of, of Elijah. And the first one I want to just read through, just very briefly, is Moses. <clears throat> and we have Moses' Moses's encounter with God. And he says, but, he said, this is where Moses has asked God in Exodus chapter 33, and we're reading out of verse, uh, verse 20. And this is where Moses is asking God to see him. Trevor, Trevor mentioned it, I believe, last week as well. And he said, and God's response is, yes, but you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where, where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I pass by. And then I will remove my hand and you will see my back. But my face must not be seen. His face could not be seen because it, nobody can see God and live. That is the holiness of God. And now put us into that situation. All right? Put our progressive state into that situation. And how many of us in this room would be like, all right, hey, God's going to walk by this, this cliff. Let's see if we can get some welding glasses. Yeah, man. Let's, let's figure out how we, can, how we can develop a screen so that we can see God, so that we can, we can experience God in a new and better way, so that we can know more than the previous generation. God is so holy that He couldn't even show Himself. Otherwise, Moses would die. That is the God that we worship. That is the holiness that we need to understand. Later, when you see God 
talking to Moses through the burning bush, and he says, who are you? He says, I am. The reason he says I am is because there is absolutely nothing that he can compare himself to. He is holy, absolutely holy. So you go to another prophet. Now, when you think about the prophets, you think, hey, man, these guys are, these guys are holy guys, especially when we're talking about Isaiah. And we see here in chapter 6 and verse 5, this is where um, the, the king Uzziah had died, and there was, there was a lot of chaos going on, okay? And the, the prophet took a lot of stress at this point in his life, and, and, God, and God shows him this vision, okay? And he sees the angels around God, and he sees them crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And when Elijah sees this, Elisha sees this, he says, Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am, a, I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. We have one of the most powerful prophets in the Bible who sees, who sees this and says, woe to me, I am ruined. I look on this thing, and I am done. That is the holiness of God. And somehow we expect that we can just enter into his presence and everything's going to be great. We need to understand that we cannot even comprehend the holiness of God. A.W. Tozer says that you can, people can understand, they can fear God's power. They can understand his mercy. But we cannot comprehend, we cannot even imagine the holiness of God. So what does that mean? Again, most of us would sit back and say, all right, so I, I, I understand that. I understand that. God is holy. God is holy. God is perfect. If I were to ask, let's raise our hands, how many of you believe that God is perfect? Probably a lot of people would raise their hands. How many believe God is holy? Fantastic. Have we learned anything new about him today? Absolutely not. We sing songs and we got the same exact message that, that I'm saying right now. So what difference does it make? And the difference it makes is if you look at 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. And we see it says, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as, you have, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am am holy. Ouch. God is asking us to be holy. Man, if we don't understand what holiness is, can we ever be what we're supposed to be? Absolutely not. When we look at the attributes of God, when we say, man, I see, I see the holiness of God, I see the perfectness of God, and then I turn around and I realize, Oh, man, God's asking me to be like that? He's not asking me to be a better person than the person before me. He's not asking me to change my perception of who God is. He's asking me to understand who he is, and he's asking me to be like that. Those aren't my words. That's not my opinion. That's what the Bible's saying. And the danger in our progression is that we get to the point where we put our perception, we put our progression onto this, and we go, ah, oh, man, but you know, God, that, that's, a, that's a pretty high standard. We can't really do that. God will understand if we can't. Why? Because, hey, we matter. We matter. So it's, it's all right. I'm not actually going to do that thing. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do And we expect a God who is so holy and perfect that it destroys people just to see him to change because of something we can't do. Now, it sounds silly when you put it that way, and yet that's what we do when we progress who we see God to be, when we go with society as opposed to God. <clears throat> so what does that look like? Now I know we're sitting here and going, man, how do you be holy? That's not even possible. We just talked about the fact that we can't comprehend God's holiness. So what does that mean for us? Does that make it hopeless? No, absolutely not. Because as holy as God is, he has a perfect plan for you and I. And that's Jesus Christ. That is Jesus Christ. But before we can understand the salvation 
that is offered to us. We have to understand the holiness that we have to approach. If we were to go before God, God is so perfect, He cannot look upon sin. And so we have Jesus. We have Jesus that we are able to accept as our Lord and Savior. And He gets us to the first part of holiness, and that's justification. That's being justified. When we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we are justified in Him. And they call that a positional holiness, simply because we have taken Him on as our Lord and Savior. And I say Lord very intentionally. God is not somebody we just add on. When we say, I, I accept the fact that God is my Lord and Savior, I'm accepting the fact that I fall underneath Him. I'm accepting the fact that I don't own my life anymore that He does. So I'm justified. I have a positional holiness between me and God that God can look on me. The second part of that falls onto us, and that's the sanctification process. That's the process where we become like Christ that is ongoing for the rest of our lives. That doesn't mean we just get to be saved, okay, I'm going to sit over here. No, that means that we become like Him. That is the practical holiness. That is what we need to be doing every single day. Why do we need to do that? Because God tells us that He wants us to be holy. And I know you're sitting there going, again, man, that's difficult. That's really difficult. How do I deal with that? Man, I don't know if I can. Take it a step back to understanding the holiness of God. Now he's given you a plan. He said, man, I've sacrificed my son for you so that you can come and actually see me. Now all I want is for you to do this process to become more like me. Are we really that important that we can sit there and say, hey, man, God, I like the first part? Nah, I don't buy into the second part. Have we progressed with our mindset to the point that we are more important than God? I hope not. I hope not. So the second part is sanctification, the practical process of holiness. And the third one is glorification. And this is where they call it the permanent holiness. This is where when we die or when Jesus comes back and we face him, that we are holy forever. The hope that that gives us that we will spend an eternity in perfect union with God. We like the third part. We like the first part. But somehow we've gotten to this point where we don't believe we need to do the second part. That's a very, very dangerous place to be. So what does that sanctification process look like? And there's just four things that I want to, that, uh, again, this is out of Chip, Chip Ingram's book, true, uh, The True God, or The Real God. And there's four things that he brings out. The first one is out of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 14, and it's a commitment that we, that we have to make. Holiness is a commitment. This is not something that we do once off and we say, okay, nope, that's, that's it, I've got it done. We can all do that, right? We're doing that right now. We come in and we pray. We sing a song like that. We, we feel emotionally touched. We're like, this is amazing. That's our once-off thing. Fantastic. That's not what this is about. Holiness is about a commitment. And the first one is make every effort, every effort, to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Make every effort. Does that say make some effort? Does that say make, make a little bit of effort? No, it says make every effort. That is a commitment and a half. In order for us to achieve, to get to that point of walking through the sanctification process, we have to commit to that process. It's not something we can do once a week. It's not something we can do once in a while. We have to commit. The second one that he brings out is the, it's a way that we think. And this one, if you look at Ephesians uh, chapter 4, verse 22. <clears throat> And it says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful des desires. Verse 23, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self 
created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Okay, so now we get into a rub. It's a mindset. It's a mindset. Now, if we just sit back and, and, and again, we're sitting on the fact that, hey, man, we can do whatever we want. Okay, that's fine. Then you go do your thing. But if God has called us to holiness, then it's a mindset that we have. We don't get to entertain the world and come worship God. He's asked you, be holy. Be committed to this process. And after you commit yourself, it's a mindset. It's the way we think about everything that we experience. Is your mindset about holiness? Or is it about your own progression? The third one he brings out is it's a command that we obey. And we've already read in 1 Peter chapter 1 where we are called to be holy as he who has called us, right? So this is a command. So if you look through these three, and again, feel free to disagree with me. That, that's absolutely up to you. Okay, but this is the word of God. This is not my opinion. If God is calling you to be holy, and in order to be holy, he's, it's, you've got to be committed, and you've got to change your mindset. Then, and, and for us to be able to say, no, man, I don't want to do that, we are listening to a command that God has given us, and we're saying, hey, man, I don't want that. That is a dangerous place to be. That is a very dangerous place to be. And the last one that he says is... The attitude we develop. And his quote for this one, he says, attitude we develop. It's not, the attitude of holiness is not a haughtier, I'm holier than thou treatment of others. It's an uncompromising, gut-level rejection of evil behavior. Uncompromising, gut-level rejection of evil behavior. When we get to that point that we are not trying to entertain what we shouldn't, we're not trying to move down something that's just good for us, but we're actually, we have that gut level reaction. This is wrong. So you know what? I'm not going to do it. Why? Because I'm pursuing holiness. I'm not pursuing myself. That is the process of sanctification that God is asking us to walk on. Now, I know I said, man, you're going to get to a point and it's like, oh, this is heavy. This, this is very heavy. But the idea isn't to push us down. The idea is to sit and realize that in this process, God has given us the answer in Jesus Christ. In this process, He has granted us access to a holy God. We have a hope of an eternal life. Absolutely. And He's given us simple framework to get there. All we have to do is realize, am I following my footsteps? Have I progressed in my thinking to where God doesn't need me to be holy? Because you know what? If I were to ask you, man, can you go out and, and party? Can you go out and do this? Can you go out and do that? If you were to line that up against God's holiness, would you be able to stand there and say, yes, I, I am representing God and I am being holy by doing this? No. No. And yet somehow we get ourselves to the point that we're able to live our lives however we are and, and God just loves us. Understand the holiness of God and then understand the fact that He has asked you to be holy. <clears throat> so as I close out, just for simplistic purposes, Again, we set, God sets a standard very high, and I've heard it a lot in my life. Man, God's standard is too high. Man, that, that standard is too high. I can't achieve that. Man, that's, that's not possible. And so what we do is we rationalize and we bring down our standard. God's standard does not change. It remains constant because God remains constant. If we delude ourselves as the next generation into thinking we can lower the standard and because all of us agree, then God has to agree because that's what we do, right? If we don't like something in the government, we protest. If we don't like something in the, in the church, we protest. We throw our toys out the cot. We all get together and if enough of us gets together, things change. God cannot change. 
And if we lower the standard on God, the only thing we're doing is not reaching God's standard He's asked us to reach. Do you want to be in a situation where you stand before God one day and you say, hey, but God, isn't this your standard? He said, no. No, my son. You know my standard, but you created a different one for me. That's not our place. As the next generation, you're going to face a world that says, change with me. Change with me. Accept what I want to accept. Accept this viewpoint. I honestly cannot listen to the radio anymore because I get so frustrated at the opinions that are thrown across that we have to accept because that's what we do as human beings. And you say, hey, man, acceptance, that's great. We should accept. <clears throat> if we look at Romans chapter 1, And we look at verse 20, it says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, for although they knew God, they neither glorified Him, glorified Him as God, nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be the wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man, birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impur impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served together, served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. And down in verse 32, although they knew, they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. How much does that sound like our world today? How much does that sound like the pressures we have on ourselves? Are we going to be a people that knew what God asked us to do and still did different and approved of other people that did different? Are we going to accept what this world gives us and say that must be who God is? Or is this next generation going to stand up and understand that God is calling us to be holy? He is calling us to be separate from this world. He is calling us to be a light to this world, not become a part of this world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, God, Holy God, we love you. It's, it's impossible for us to understand your holiness. It's impossible for us to understand exactly who you are, God, but I pray that you would guide each one of us, Lord, that we would be able to study your word, that we would be able to dive into who you are, that we would be able to, as Christians, talk about who you are, about what you've called us to, about what we should be doing, that we would not be ashamed of who you are, that our holiness would create a community where we would develop holiness, Father. I pray for each person in this room, including myself, that you would guard our hearts and minds, that we would seek holiness, that this church would seek holiness, that the cell groups within this church would seek holiness. God, we love you. We are so unimaginably grateful for the salvation that you have given us because our deeds deserve death. And I just pray that each one of us, as we accept that salvation, as we accept a Savior that is freely given to us, that we'd accept you as Lord and that we would take the call to be holy seriously and that we'd apply it to our lives. And if we struggle, I pray that you would give us the courage to find people to help us. 
And when we fall, I pray that you'd give us the grace to have those around us pick us back up and that we can rely on you. God, we love you. We love you with everything that we have. And we thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf so that we can be justified in him and have an eternal life with you. In Jesus' name, amen.